coming at the last masterclass of Game Made in Europe program. So today the speaker is Christophe Zerast, head of the Live Hops division at NACON. So you can ask your question all along the presentation, thanks to the question box you have, and uh, Christophe will answer it during or at the end of the presentation. So please stay focused. So Christophe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to talk today about live operation, uh, a very big topic, one that I started tackling at NACON and for which I've already done probably like this smaller version of this presentation, basically to 10, 15 studios already. Um, and when we talk about live operation, generally there's always one thing that people have in mind is, oh, it's great to make money. Uh, some, some companies like EA Activision, uh, Ubisoft do a lot. I don't know if you know the numbers, they're public numbers. EA is doing 71% of their revenues uh, with just live services. So it does not even count the, the game. Uh, Blizzard is at 61% and Ubisoft is 44%. But when I present about live operations, I don't like to talk too much about money. I prefer to see money as a means to an end, as a way to basically fulfill the basic needs that we all have as game creators to you know, be less stressed about having to release many games. You know, like if you look at Ubisoft, uh, 15 years ago, they were releasing about 20 games a year, now way less. Um, and if you have less pressure to release many games and you have money, you can also, you have, you know, like more opportunities you know, like to retain all of the great talents that you're working with on a daily basis. Um, and that also works externally for the players because players you know, like with live uh, games, they tend to stick around longer. So this is good you know, like in terms of getting recognition in the industry and, and getting like players to really, you know, a lot of players to play your game. And the really the end goal for this is really to be able to build the game that you've always dreamt of building one of the main discussion that i always have with the studios that i that i that i talk with and i work with is oh we've had so many ideas that we've had to you know like remove from the scope of the game and i told them then you know like why don't we build a plan so that over the next two or three years we slowly build you know like and add all of the features that you wanted to have inside the game. So the goal is not to produce you know, like money, it's just to make sure that we're producing enough money so that we can make the, 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 the game grow and, and get towards basically where, if we had unlimited money, we would be able kind of like to drive uh, the game to. Uh, that is of course easier said than done and live operations will and that's the reason why it's so complex to do it is because it will challenge the entire organization. And when I talk about live operation, I talk about seven pillars that really worked together. The first is how do you build and maintain long-term motivation for the players with the game design, right? Uh, then we talk about the monetization, which you know, like is super hard to do because we want a fair and rewarding system. Fair and rewarding systems basically will be based on opinions, so it's super hard to do. Uh, marketing and sales as well is made differently when you have a live ops game, like you communicate, you operate sales uh, differently. You need to have super robust analytics because you will take tons of decision during the course of your live operations. Every day, basically, you need data to take decision. Then, you know, like a live game is basically kind of like always on development. So when I talk about support and QA, I mean development support. I talk about customer support and of course QA, because uh, the goal is to continue improving the game and maintain high level of services. So that's kind of like the five big pillars, but then we need to also think that we need tools. Uh, to operate our games. So if we talk about monetization, I need a store. I talk about communication, I need something to engage the player outside, outside but also inside the game. I need you know, like my analytics platform so I can you know, like do the dashboard and stuff like this. And I need tools as well so that I can support the player 
from the game because you know like if i have a store and someone is making a purchase it doesn't come through well then i will need uh with my customer support team i need to be able to you know like unlock that content inside the game and finally the seventh pillar you know like that kind of like ties everything together and that a lot of people often forget and then they really suffer when when their game comes you know like is live are all of the collaboration and processes that you need to operate the game because there's you know like it's a live game so many things will happen on a daily basis if you're not prepared and you don't know how to react to a certain situation you're going to lose time and losing time and not being efficient in your communication means you're going to lose players and that's not something that you want to do when you're a live game right so let's let's start with you know like game design first you know like how do we build a game that's as fun to play on day 1000 than it will it was on on day 1 so one of the things that I like to use is a retention framework model uh, developed by, uh, by Department of Play. Uh, I like it because it's quite simple to kind of explain what drives motivation for players. So the first thing, you know, uh, that's very easy is the, the appeal, right? The game appeal is whatever, you know, like the fantasy you're selling, you know, like key gameplay points, you know, like that will make people attracted to your game. So that's why people are buying the game. It's the highest motivation to start playing the game, but then it will fade quite quickly. Um, the second element is, do you have, you know, like a sense of progression? So it can be experience points, RPG, but also like, am I progressing through the story? So that is usually quite high at the beginning. And then, slowly you know like we will get a bit lower in terms of boosting motivation then there you know like whatever stuff you can bring in into the game freebies you know like building some small events so that there's a sense of fresh you know like things happening and the last one which is super important is you know like whatever social features new content you can bring to the game on a regular basis to keep that motivation up um, and do three elements progression you know like events and stuff like this new new features and content i like to think that you know like we need to understand how those things feed the end game so you know when when i talk about end game it's like when players have you know like understood all of the game mechanics when they finish the story if you have one what is there that's left to do, right? Uh, when they finish, for example, getting to the max level e experience point that you have in the game, what is there to do? So let's try and, you know, like dig into what it means for end game and progression. Uh, what are you able to use that's currently in the game to extend the progression to infinite level? And of course, the challenge there is that it needs to remain meaningful and fun for the players. Uh, we have examples that are well known, for example. So you get to level 100 with Diablo, then you have the Paragon level where you know, like, it's like infinite leveling. Uh, you have the destiny model where you know, like you're, you've got an experience system, but that's kind of like the tutorial. And then it's the loot that define you know, like your power rating and, and your progression in the game. Then you also have like adding a new uh, a new goal for the player so you know like if you've played anno you know that the goal for anno is to build a, a, a city that is economically sound but then what the the developers did with anno which was super smart was like hey now you've got you know like a, a perfect city you've achieved the campaign we're going to give you a new objective that is you know like a beauty system a beauty metric so that your goal then is to spend more time on improving the, the quality, the visual quality of your city. And then there's the obvious, you know, uh, things that we all know of, which is you can have like a solo campaign and then you go into a multiplayer campaign where you race against players. If we look at end game and social, the most important thing here is how is your game able to let players build their own stories? Um, good example for that, for example, you take the division, the dark zone in the division is a super interesting concept where you can't tell who's a friend and who's a foe. So you may meet someone in the game and you're know, like partner up and cover each other, but that person may betray you at the last minute because they have a system where you need to, you know, extract loot to be able to use it then uh, in the full game. 
that is a storyteller uh, machine in in design, right? Uh, the same can be said with Eve Online, where you know, like Eve Online, you have the controlled space where you can't do PvP. You know, like because you know, like you have systems made in place to protect the player, and then you go outside that space, and then the players build their own rules and their own stories. Uh, very nice book, by the way, if you have the chance to look for it online. Um, there's a book that was made by a, a journalist about 10 years of stories uh, between players on, on EVE Online. It's absolutely crazy. It is like a, a, a political thriller. It's super, super interesting. And you can also have, you know, like, if you, if you take Destiny, uh, anyone who has played a raid with Destiny has stories about their friends, you know, like screwing up a, 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 a platform puzzle and then you're know, like having fun, you're know, like trying to just, you know, like do those, those things. And then epic boss battles where, you know, like if someone is not playing their part, that also, you know, like is, is building uh, stories. And those games have all something in common is that they're very, very popular with YouTubers and streamers because those guys, you know, kind of like their bread and butter is telling their own stories to their audience. So this is super interesting. And we'll, I'll talk a bit about, more about the, the content creators because they are super important when you're operating a live game. They are very important partners. So if in your game design you've already thought about that social aspect that story builder that will be super helpful on the long run for the success of your game then end game and content uh, what's complicated there is you know you're gonna have a game you want to add new content on a regular basis adding new features so the way you're going to build assets you know like in the game the way your code is set up needs to be really you know like thought of, thought about at the beginning like if i have an offline offline game you're know, like and then i'm like hmm, maybe i can bring some of the components some of the features online did i basically think about this early on when i was writing the code to allow me to do this or not you know i've, I've got example where we had a, a great game uh from nakon and then you know like we released it and then we're like oh damn we could have done it online version or online modes of this but then it was not possible because the code was not made to uh, to accommodate for this uh, and then you're like we need to ask questions about how long how much money to integrate build new items skins you know because it's um like if you go for very very high quality you know like content but then it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to produce then think about the fact that maybe with a live game you need to release hundreds of those you know like on a yearly basis that's something that you need to think about really early on. same for user generated content it's not because you have user generated content uh, modules or mods that there's not worked uh, that needs to be done because you know like ugc means moderation and that's that's a lot of work and, and also basically can be a can be a, a money sin that you need to think about and the last element for content is can you increase the playground uh, easily as well you know like did you make it that in that you can add more more pieces that expand the playground of the game and how much time and money is that going to cost so all of those things are super important to think about how you're going to increase the amount of content uh, inside your game now let's talk about monetization. Uh, building a fair and rewarding system, like I said, is no easy, uh, easy feat. And one of the exercises that I like to, you know, like always go with, you know, like the, the dev team I work with is first, what do players want? The first, you know, like obvious kind of like content is that some players, they want to have more immersion, right? You're playing The Witcher 3, you know, like buying the DLC Blood and Wine is a no brainer. Love the experience, love the lore, lore, you know, like I want, I want more. So if you give it to me, I'll buy it, no problem. The only thing is that there is a time to market, let's say, uh, the thing that you always need to take into account. You release uh, like a DLC with new map, new stories too early, then you have a PR crisis and influencer crisis because people will think that, yeah, that content should have been to the main game. So you really need to think about, um, about the, the timing for this. Uh, let's talk about gameplay then. Like 
people want more gameplay, they want more depth in the gameplay. Rainbow Six is a good example. Um, if uh, you see or if you've played the game, you know that they have different operators. Whenever they are adding operators, what they're adding is strategy gameplay. They are adding depth. And the goal there is not to add, you know, like a character that is overpowered. So the challenge is that whenever they're adding a character, they need to think about the balancing. Social differentiation, well, Fortnite is the obvious king of social differentiation. You have a, a game where, you know, like you have social ups, people see each other a lot, they compare themselves. So you want to be able to, you know, like bring them a lot of, uh, a lot of skins and, and ways for them to differentiate themselves. Then social recognition. So gifting, for example, is one of these features uh, that can provide this. There was an example that I used, which is Star, Fleet, Star Trek Fleet Command. When you're inside a clan, if you buy something inside the game, you will give some freebies to all of the members of your uh, clan. So that's one way they've done you know, like, uh, the social recognition. Some people love this. They like to you know, like be useful or be recognized for their contribution. Some YouTubers use the same. If you've seen you know, like some games, for example, there are YouTubers that specialize you know, like in, in giveaways and stuff like this, having the gifting system allows them to get social recognition from their audience. Um, then we have dopamine. So not everyone likes it, obviously, but some players love it. You know, that's one of the reasons why Diablo Immortal is still on the market, still going strong and making tons of money. Some people love the casino aspects of the loot box or, you know, like triggering uh, rifts with very expensive gem. Some people love it. Uh, then there are the shortcuts. Some people basically, you know, like don't have a lot of time and they're perfectly fine with buying, you know, some XP boost, for example, to get through the game a little bit faster and cut some corners on the secondary missions and stuff like this. Still a gray zone and gray area. Not everyone appreciates this, but some people basically like it. That's why basically some games, you know, like have gone. And then the last thing, which is really geared towards the way free to play is working, is providing players with power. So, you know, like some players absolutely feel great about being number one in the, in the leaderboards, in the arena. And when you're playing a free-to-play game, you know, like, for example, Marvel Strike Force, uh, the Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, what players are buying, they are buying the, the, the meta characters that allow them to be number one in the arena. Not the cup of tea for everyone, definitely not great for any premium games. But that's the, the core of the free-to-play market is based on power progression and offering that power to players. Uh, once we kind of like understand you know, like what players you know, like are want to buy, uh, it's how to price things. And that's probably the hardest uh, thing to do. Obviously, number one thing that anyone needs to do when you're trying to establish pricing is benchmark the market. Uh, and when I say benchmark the market, it's the whole market for the industry, so mobile games included. What do they sell? How much do they sell things? How frequently do they sell? You know, like what is free as well uh, and not being sold? These, these are super important questions to allow you to understand, you know, what are your competitors doing? What are, you know, and what are other people doing on the market as well? Um, then, you need to think about the fact that not everyone is equal with money. So you need to think about every single different purse. Uh, what can a player buy with one euro, 10 euro, 20 euro, 50 euro? What can they buy if they have unlimited amount of money? You need to think about what you're offering to every purse. And then last but not least, probably the most important exercise that you need to do is seek feedback from your community, from people you trust within the industry, get feedback. Like, cause like I said, monetization being fair, that's all about perception. You know, if you go and discuss with your core community and they say it's okay, think about the fact that maybe journalists or YouTubers that have no attachment to your game, they won't like it. So 
take what your community is saying, for example, divided by two, you have maybe like what people will kind of like feel about your monetization. So if your community is not excited or they, they're not super positive about it, that's going to be a tough sell probably for the rest of the market. Um, and one last piece of advice is when we're thinking about monetization, always think about also the non-payers. Uh, you need to be generous with the non-payers. You need to be super generous with payers. So it's like if you build a hundred, uh, you know, like new content that you want to sell to the player, you probably need to put at least twenty percent on the side that you're going to give basically as freebies in, in the form of events or stuff like this. But you need to think about that free track. Let's say it's a little bit like when you're talking about a, a battle pass. You need to have the free track. Uh, even if you don't have a battle pass, you need to think about this, the, the, free, the freebies that you're going to give to the, to, the, to the active players, to the, the people that are loyal, at least to the game, even if they're not spending money. Um, then what I like to do is, is, is build a small exercise with the dev team that I work with. And I always tell them, like, try to think, before you try to think about, you know, like what you can sell, stuff like this, try to think about, you know, taking your players on a journey, you know, and I always have them kind of like work on a four-year exercise and I use a hunting game as an experience and say, well, if we had four years of content that we wanted to build for a hunting game, maybe the first year is, you know, like winter. So I've got a winter theme for a year, then year two, I go on a safari, year three, I go to Mongolia, year four, I go to Amazonia. And that gives me a, a creative framework to think about the different types of content that I want to put during each season. Um, so I can think about, you know, uh, what kind of new content I'm going to monetize, free content I'm going to give away, new features, events. Uh, so, you know, like if I think about winter and new content, can I build new weapons, new vehicle, maybe a uh, you know, like a snow uh, snowmobile or stuff like this, a new gear to resist winter, and then you can do that same exercise for Safari Mongolia. So it's quite fun to do. And then you're like, it's, it's nicer for the, for the players as well because they, they don't feel that you know, like you're trying to sell weird stuff to them. Like try to build a story, take them on a journey. Once you know, you know, like kind of like where you want to take your player, then you can start you know, like defining a little bit, okay, how much content am I able to produce? And then you can choose your live model because depending on how much content you can produce, you're not necessarily going to use the same uh, business model. If you produce um, a little bit of content, not too much, you're more going to go with DLCs in a year pass. If you're able to put out thousands of content on a season basis, you need an in-game store, you can do rotation system, you can do crazy amount of stuff and you can build a season pass as well. So like I said, the main difference as well that you're going to have between these two models, obviously, and it's also tied to money, is the fact that on DLCs, most of the games will release maybe one or two features, you know, like over the lifetime of the game. When a truly live game that is releasing, you know, like tons of content on a yearly basis, they have the money, so to speak, uh, to release many new features uh, per year. Why, why is one model making more money than the others? Um, on the plus side, the DLCs are great because you rely on the first party to do the job of selling your content. You don't need uh, support tools or at least very little customer support uh, tools. They take care of the, of, the, of the support, right? The challenge is that when you want to animate your store or at least you know like the dlcs and like do some sales and stuff like this you're dependent on the first party right and some of them have rules you want to do a sales on on the game and it's dlcs maybe there's a theme that you need basically to fit into otherwise you can't do the sales and then there's the the commitment from the player as well when you're selling a year pass you're asking for a 12 months commit that is way harder than to sell a three months commit with a season's pass um, and on the plus side basically for the in-game store on the other side store animation is easy because you can do all of your bundles your discount you know like you're quite free like you don't need to rely on the first party to allow you to do discounts and stuff like this. The downside, obviously, is that you need the tools 
to do the customer support, you know, like when I talked about, you know, like players that have issue with unlocks, for example, you're the one that's in charge of this, right? It's a little bit easier with the DLC because they have the token system and it's generally a, a no brainer. It's really easier to, uh, to handle than, uh, than the rest. Like if the token system works, normally it works for everyone. There shouldn't be a reason why it doesn't. Uh, and I've talked so I've talked a little bit about tools. So uh, it's a slide that I that I talk to some of the partners that I that I work with. You know, they always love is like, what do I need in terms of tools to operate a full live ops game with store and stuff like this? It's quite complete. There's a lot there. You know, like, so if you have a store, of course that store needs to be updated live. You need to be able to manage you know like what goes where in the store you know, like you want to activate gifting systems uh, you want to be able to build your bundles manage rotation do targeting then if you have targeting system then you can do a b testing and then if you're lucky enough you know like after a few years of releasing many 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 content you probably want to hook up an ai so that the ai can help you you know like figure out uh you know like segmentation and propose offer to uh to players then we talked about engagement. So, you know, like I knew I need news, you know, like I need to communicate to my players. The game is obviously one of the best, you know, like place to communicate to players. Pop-up systems uh, can be used for many things, maintenance, um, events, uh, but also for the store. Loading pages as well. Like we have great, you know, like new gen consoles now, but loading paging, loading pages are still a thing. They still exist. And if you have a live game, you want that game to always feel fresh, right? So that means being able to swap the loading pages for new ones on a regular basis. That's the small stuff that make the, the game feel alive leaderboards as well you know, like being able to run regular events using leaderboards or challenge system that you can use on an individual or a community base you know like um, if you for example say hey if you reach uh, 50 million uh, races during this weekend uh, played which might be a, a big crazy number uh, you can unlock this new car for example that's an example of a community challenge to create some events. Uh, being able also like to engage using temporary boost, super useful, especially at the end, for example, of a season, people are struggling maybe to finish the season pass, show some generosity, being able to activate a double XP, four time XP, basically on um, during a weekend, that's gonna be super appreciated and that still like keeps the game a little bit alive. Um, being able to snap your finger and create live content. So how do you do this? Let's say you have a, a racing game. What would be awesome is if you provide basically a simple tool for your community manager or anyone else basically that has zero technical knowledge with a back office where they can create races, custom races anytime. Then if they can do this, and then events, like let's say you modify the UI of your game uh, for I don't know, Halloween event, then you want to be able to switch it in or out, uh, you know, like automatically with a schedule system um, when the event is live and when it basically it's, it's, uh, it's on. Uh, then you have tools that you need for the analytics, where you need to document every single piece of thing that you're tracking. Maybe you need to add the player account, and then there's, you know, like different things that you need to track. And last but not least, uh, the support tools. <clears throat> so being able to refound, being able to bring in your like or unlock missing items, uh, the mass add or remove, those you know like mass add of items can be used for compensation and mass removal is more you know like for let's say you have players that exploit the game. No worries. Um, and the removal basically is you know, like if players you know like kind of like exploit the game and they unlock something that normally should have given them uh, taken them you know like 10 hours to be able to to get then you want to be able to you know like directly act on the account and remove that content that they unlawfully let's say or <laughs> like got um then you have of course moderation uh, system especially like if you have chat or ugc Moderation means that you need to be able to ban people, ideally from part of the game, uh, not necessarily from the, the full game. So having that option is always, uh, is always better. Uh, let's, let's say if you have a UGC module and you can ban people just from using the UGC, that's actually better. Uh, and then you need player 360, especially for your customer support team, because when they're going to you know, like 
have people on the phone or they have you know tickets that they need to answer they need to very very quickly be able to see you know like when a player started to play how much money has they spent you know like what was the last thing that they've done in the game stuff like this and you need an audit trail as well um, especially when you deal with hard currency for example uh, you have certification requirements from sony where you need to keep six years of data and you need to be able to uh, con you know, like reply to them very quickly when they contact you about you know, like uh, a transaction uh, that they're discussing with a player. So all of those things are super important and that is the whole package that you need to have for uh, live ops tools. Then we talk about marketing and sales. So marketing and sales you know, like the main issue is the, the communication strategy. So on if you work on the short term, that's great. You build surprises, you build that fear of missing out. That's awesome for monetization, but that's very poor for retention. On the other side, if you work on long term, what's great is that, you know, like you can give detailed roadmap, players are super happy, they know, you know, like what they're getting into, but why is it bad for monetization? That's because people in their mind will be like, okay, season one is great content. I will buy stuff. Season two and three, not interested. Maybe season four, I'll, you know, like I'll back into the game. So you don't necessarily want people to kind of like do that mental process of like, what do I like or don't like? So there's one guiding factor that I always use with the teams that I work with, which is, you know, the, the more... In advance, you want to communicate about things, the less detailed information you give. Uh, and that's the reason why you probably all have seen this already in the industry. They're quite famous, you know, like the yearly roadmap for content. When you check, for example, the roadmap for Rainbow Six, the difference between the Japanese operator, the Belgian operator, the Singaporean operator, we don't know. You just know that there are operators that they're releasing. Same for you know, like the features as well. They don't go too much into the details. For the features, it's obvious. It gives them some leeway as well, basically, to work on you know, like fine tuning and stuff like this. They're probably not ready yet to talk about rank 2.0, you know, like one year before when they're probably still you know, like uh, designing things. Uh, but yeah. So and usually those things always come you know, like with four different levels. What are what is the new monetized content? What are the new features? What engagement elements uh, are coming? And then the quality of life. Here you can see like a lot of things around player protection, console improvements. So those are the four kind of like main of themes that you that you get. Uh, and the main challenge basically to do this is the fact that obviously a roadmap means a commitment to your players. Uh, so it's super. It's a very delicate work between the marketing team that will probably push to have like the most sexy you know like roadmap with tons of stuff and the dev team was going like, okay reality check and i really basically deliver all of these things within the year uh, with the challenge you know like of the fact that every three months you have season you need to basically like like uh, patch things because you're adding new features. So you probably need to do debugging as well. But at the same time, you need to deliver the next season. That's that's a lot of pressure to take in. Uh, knowing that, that this is you know, like the roadmap for the long term, but you also need to have your own everyday roadmap where you need to think about what's happening every day in terms of permanent repeatable activities, seasonal activities, monthly activities, weeklies, dailies. Um, in live operation, you know, like especially like the mobile, the mobile teams or mobile games are very good at this. Every single event for them is an opportunity to bring something, you know, like to the table, like a, a new, new, new bundle or something like this. It's an opportunity to sell. Content creators. So I've talked about it a little bit already. Content creators are super, super useful. Like they can help you market your game. Like if, if you have that storytelling abilities in, in that's inside your game design, but they can also help sell your game and content within your game if you do operation like uh, revenue sharing operation. So I've given some examples there with Mr. Beast working with Fortnite, Mr. Disrespect working with Rock Company, you've got Ninja and Fall Guys. Those are, of course, like a lot of like big name YouTubers, 
but every YouTubers, you know, like love to have their own branded asset inside the game. So it's not because, you know, like it's not because they're not a PewDiePie or whatever that you can't work with YouTubers. Some, you know, like will be super happy to work with you. And what's great with the revenue share system is that it's a joint partnership. You know, it's they will stream the game. They will talk about your game because they're vested which is way different from the traditional, you know, I pay 50,000 euros and you make one video about my game and then I'm crossing figures that people would buy the game, you know? So the revenue sharing strategy and you're like, it feels more authentic for the YouTubers and it's way more interesting, especially like if you don't want to fork out a lot of money up front, it's way easier. Um, on the financial aspect. Then there are all of the tools that you can build, you know, like the Twitch drop system, you know, like some uh, tools like Azarus, uh, a small company that's super interesting. They've been used a lot by Ubisoft, especially on Rainbow Six. So it's like um, a system where the YouTubers and the streamers especially can uh, do uh, trivia and stuff like this. People earn tokens and those tokens can be spent on the secondary store where you can buy stuff for the game super super awesome worked really well for them and then the gifting system super nice especially for all of the youtubers that are more specialized in, in giveaways and then there's the third one which is like really treat them as partners uh, give them access to test servers invite them to your studios to let them know you know like what's happening like if you check you know like a bit every live game they have a uh, crazy amount of uh, of youtubers that you know, like do uh, patch updates videos and stuff like this so they're they're your own media uh, then we can talk about sales so sales what's interesting you know, like for example here the example that i that i used is uh, dead by daylight when you check the 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 sales that they were doing in 2016 and the one that they do today you can see that it's completely not the same they multiply by what four or five uh yeah four at least so the reason for this is very simple it's very logical you know like when they release the game they're still learning about their player base they're still fine-tuning their retention their monetization me mechanism maybe their content production pipeline is not fully mature yet and they're not able to you know like ramp up as many features as they, they want so they're going to basically just keep the player base big enough to continue uh, you know like working on the game so that's what they're doing you know, like in the first maybe a few years then once you know like they really know their players in and out they know that they have good retention that's where basically acquiring people players is much more important than you know just selling the game for a higher mark so you know like even if the game was free to play probably the business would still be good you know and some some games you know like i've, I've seen are even more than 60 percent. they're like 90 percent. but that's okay because you have a live game you know that maybe on average you retain players for you know like six seven months and you know that basically yeah as long as you acquire a lot of people the business will work out so that concludes kind of like the marketing then the analytics and the support part i will talk about like kind of like very briefly uh what's important with analytics when i talked about you know like taking a lot of decision it's really like about everything so it can be about modifying part of the game or the full game uh, it can be adapting the planning so let's say oh you know like i was supposed to release new content for six months but i realized that my players are really unhappy and i need to focus you know like on retention and fixing the game like some games like if you remember the division one for example first time i saw this you know like ubisoft decide to remove and push back every single dlc and 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 monetize content for at least four months and they focus only on listening to the player and fixing the game and result they got all of their players back people were super happy and it's the first time that i saw as well um journalists talking about a patch 1.4 like it was a release of the game which was kind of like crazy uh, adapting the economy as well you know, like uh, even if you do all of the things that i've talked before you may still need to adapt the economy because it doesn't work out or you know like it can also help you or communicate differently to the to the players uh, when you have the right data um, so the way you use data basically there's always two big main families there's everything that allows you to understand the behavior of the players, the telemetry, you know, like what they're buying, the sales, stuff like this. Uh, but then also there's what they're telling you. 
And so you're like, when you're able to kind of like mix the behavioral aspect with kind of like the motivational aspect, that's where you can really build insights that will be relevant. Uh, there's one thing, for example, that I that I'm always trying to do is make sure that the community managers and the analysts work hand in hand. Because one has basically all of the information, the telemetry, one has, is in direct contact with the players. If those two people don't communicate, they don't have the full picture and they can't help you do, do the, the right things. I had an example like this. I, I worked on the Ghost Recon uh, online game a, a long time ago and the community was complaining about uh, an operator being overpowered. And I had a great community manager at that time that actually worked with the, um, the, the analyst. And <clears throat> when they analyzed the data, they realized that the kill death ratio for that operator was the same. So there was no difference there that would suggest other, that an, an operator would be overpowered. However, that specific operator was like seen in like 99% of all matches, creating a perception in the player's mind that this was you know, like the strongest when actually, no, it was just the most popular. So there was, of course, you know, like higher chances that that particular operator would be number one in the game. So instead of spending like three months and a lot of money trying to balance something that didn't need balancing, they released their communication and that, you know, like allowed them to really focus on other stuff on the game. But that wouldn't have been possible if they had only listened on the community side, they would have tried to fix this. Right, uh, KPI families, activity, uh, churn, retention, you know, like DAU, MAU, uh, you know, the drill, trying to understand as well, what are people able to start, what they're able to complete, what are failing at, those are super important things. Um, and then you have also the social KPIs, like I said, the content creators are very important. So it's... Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah so streaming for example being able to know you know like how many videos stuff like this this is very important to understand the health of the game and last but not least uh, the monetization uh, aspect of course of the game uh, rpu lifetime value the average transaction value uh, per player uh, how many people basically are buying inside the game, you know, like store visits as well, and like is my store you know, like being visited enough? Stuff like this are very important in terms of analytics. Now, support in live QA, uh, development never stops. It's one of the things that I always say, you know, like it's, you're in for the long run. Uh, so one of the things that I always discuss with the, the, the dev teams, super important is staffing management. You know, it's you're getting into live operation, that means you're going to continue develop, debugging the game, upgrading the game. And that is done usually with a sizable amount of people. You don't do that with only five people, right? Uh, unless you're a super amazing team and you're able to do everything. But then even then you're like, you need to, for, if you're a full live ops game, you're like the challenge is, and you're working with season, how do you work on developing the content for season three? When you're launching season one, and you're starting to do certification for season two. That's crazy insane, right? So parallel producing happens a lot. Um, and it's something that requires, you know, like kind of like a lot of people. Um, and then you also need to deal with project fatigue. You know, some people maybe will have worked three, four years developing the game. If you haven't basically discussed early on the fact that they will probably work for more years on the game, uh, psychologically, some people might not like it too much, you know, and then you also need to have like um, plans in place to renew part of the team. And, and then how do you onboard people, you know, like on the project that already has two or three years of existence, there's so much to, to learn and understand. So staffing management is super important. Um, <clears throat> life QA as well, especially because we're adding more content every day. So you're adding uh, things in the store. Well, you need to check that the content, the pricing, the visuals, all of these things that they're working for the player. Same, I'm building an event. I'm building a, a, a multiplier X2 XP event. I need to check that the mechanism is working, that the boost is effective. And I can only do that with my QA team. And then the live bug hunting, of course, every time I'm going to add new, um, new features and stuff like this, I'm going to need to, to test uh, the game. 
Uh, and I haven't put it in there, but I know as well that some games also do sanity check on the daily basis so like the first thing on top of the day that the qa team is doing they launch the game on all platforms and they try like the 20 or 30 key features uh, of the game to make sure that they're working and they do that on a daily basis last part is the collaboration and process uh, there's three big examples that I use to kind of like illustrate the complexity of what you need to be ready for. The most obvious one, of course, is that goes for any game is how do you act on player feedback, you know, like bugs, requests, stuff like this. So <clears throat> there's a challenge of you know, like, how do you get the information? How do you understand and work together, maybe like with the analytics team or or vice versa to, you know, like understand, prioritize, be able to explain this um, in, in the best way. Uh, then there is documenting an issue so that QA is able to replicate, uh, which can trigger you know, like conversation between the different members of the team. Then the QA team will, of course, work with the dev team on the fix. And that also, basically, if they're not able to fix it properly, can go back to you know, like more QA. Then you need to test once you have a good fix. And then you need to deploy and communicate. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, like, like I explained earlier, maybe when you understand that it's not really an issue that needs fixing, it's all about communication. So all of that, you know, like you need to be ready. People need to know from the community manager, the dev team, you know, like what they need to do, especially because when you multiply this by 50 request bugs, then, you know, like that, that's a lot of work and a lot of coordination. Um, and usually like all live, go live ops game, have a coordinator of sort basically that helps with sorting things out and making sure that things don't fall through the cracks. Server crash, maintenance, um, how do you detect this or how do you plan for this and how do you communicate internally? You know, like I've worked with many projects where sometimes you know, like there's a sales that's gonna happen during the weekend and suddenly there is a maintenance happening at the same time not great and that is usually because there's not enough communication between people that usually don't communicate together the sales team and the dev team don't necessarily have a things together every day um, then of course like if you have the communication internally you need to communicate externally then you're know, like if there's let's say there's a, a server issue and we're launching a maintenance and there's a delay, that delay needs to be communicated back to the community manager so that it can tell the players. Once the fix is there, once again, internal communication and then external communication. Challenge is if you have like a live game that's kind of like an MMO and it's always live, then you need to be able to do that 24 seven. And then that's not just a question of process, that's a question of HR and are people basically do they have in their contract that they're gonna be you know, on call to work during the weekend to be able to work on these issues if they happen. And the third example that I use is exploit cheating and toxicity. And those things, you're not supposed to deal with them when they happen. Normally, you're supposed to work very early on on policy. And you're you need to communicate those policy very early on to the players so that in the case of exploit, especially, people know you know, like what they're not supposed to do. Uh, then you need to be able to detect issues. You need to be able to enforce the policy. And it's always going to be gray zone uh, discussion here. So it can be complicated. Um, external communication as well. Then once you, once you want to enforce the policy, and then you need to analyze if the policy that you've applied, is it really working and removing the problem or not? So it's just a, you know, like three examples to illustrate the, the, the challenge that a lot of different people, jobs need to work as one and need to coordinate, collaborate together um, on a regular basis. So you know, like, do you have like a group chat where everyone is discussing? Do they share a live calendar? Just you know, like to say, hey, I'm doing a maintenance. Hey, I'm doing a sales. Hey, you know, like I'm releasing that patch at that time. Stuff like this. You know, like, and then the community manager as well that should be saying, hey, well, I've got a piece of news that talks about this, so that we can see, you know, like everyone can see what everyone is doing for the players. Uh, regular touch points, of course, that are available to all because it's important that everyone feels that you know, like they understand where the game is doing, how the game is doing. 
uh, regular reports with email, can be you know, like also in-person meetups, you know, like having a war room, for example, for the launch of a new season can be great to react more quickly, you know, like if there's a crisis. Common objectives, and like I said earlier, you know, like sharing processes, and especially what's important, one of the work that I do all the time is, you know, like having some, you know, like a one cheat paper, just one pager that, you know, like explain, hey, community manager, during a launch, this is what you're responsible for. This is what you're going to be consulted on. So we do a small race and we allow, play, you know, like people in the team to understand very quickly, this is your mission. This is, this is your responsibility. Because when you do a presentation like this, where you try to explain everything, it, it can be very hard to understand what is my job within live operation. So yeah, seven pillars of live ops, uh, game design, monetization, marketing and sales, analytics, support and QA, and all of the, live, the right tools to manage basically those different pillars. And then the seventh one that's probably the most important is how do you work together so that you're ready uh, to tackle anything that comes your way. And one of the last thing that I always like to say to people is that building a live ops game, you know, like any game and any organization can be live. It's for me just a a planning issue it's it's if you haven't thought about this from day one conception you're going to struggle basically to get back on your feet so that you're ready for this um, but if you've like already thought about all of the seven pillars how you're going to organize yourself and stuff like this even if you have a narrative game like tomorrow like i always joke internally like if golem was a you know like a live ops game i would say well i would love to replace you know like the npcs by player and then i would do a uh, you know, like a, a, a hunt mode where you're as a golem, as a player, you need to escape from, you know, uh, other players, you know, that can be done. It's just like, if this was something in the mind of the, the designers, day one could have been done. So it's not happening, by the way, <laughs> just so you know. There you go. That concludes my uh, presentation. And if you have questions, uh, I'll uh, now take them. Thank you so much to Christophe. It was a really interesting presentation and I think it is the same feeling for all the participants here, I think. Uh, so we again uh, about the unexpected uh, microphone issue. <laughs> it's on me, <laughs> so it was on my side. So now we move on the Q&A session uh, in which uh, participants can all ask a question question on the zoom question box so please don't be shy it's a really a, it's really a unique chance to ask your questions to christoph so don't hesitate um i myself have a few few questions for you christoph <laughs> yes because i um it's about the motivation of the player uh what is your opinion about putting bots in multiplayer games you know um, to replace uh, real players to reduce the matchmaking making time um, have you already used it and uh, what what is your opinion about it uh, i haven't used it personally but usually if you need to use bots is because you have a problem with your matchmaking or with the progression system and you need to it's more a it's say uh, yeah it's, it's more like a, a fix than than something that people really design for like i mean that you can use bots for example just for you know, like the tutorials for example and stuff like this where it doesn't matter too much uh, but i think the challenge is that if you have a game that has low dau and you have new players coming in then you're going to have that challenge that you can't match make them against the very experienced community that already like really far away uh, in terms of progression in the game and mastery of the game so that's where you're going to need bots but players are very smart they'll know when they play against bots so that's not going to provide them a great experience so that means you're going to have a retention problem yeah. on the short term aspect so that means new player that you recruit all of the time if you don't recruit many players it's uh it's going to be a challenge for for the long-term success of the game because that means every time you lose like the long-term players it's you're losing your uh your monetization you're losing your yeah the people mm -hmm. that are attached to the game and you're not able to um uh, what i would say um 
to replenish the player base. That's what, yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Peter says, uh, I am not working on live ops, but this presentation was fire. Tons of, tons of screenshots made. Nakon is lucky they got you. Well, so question. Thank you is, very much, Peter. Isn't this a bit stressful? Like never ending story of responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good question. It is completely. That, that's why you know, like that presentation is really about planning. It's really about planning and thinking really way ahead. Like all of the dev teams that I work with, you know, like I always tell them, look, like it's it's stressful. <laughs> so I, I have I have this discussion about like the stress, but that's why you know, like when I go to them, I tell them, like, look, the goal is to plan. The goal is to understand what are your production capabilities. And we, if we want to be live, we will play along your strengths and weaknesses. We're not going to ask you to build you know, like a thousand content if you're not able to do that. And it needs to make sense for you as well. Like you're, I always tell them that you're the boss of your game. I'm not going to tell you add this or add new skins and stuff like this if it doesn't make sense for you guys. So always try to be respectful of the of the DNA of the game and the creative direction uh, and, and to try and come in as early as possible so that we can reduce that stress by a lot of planning and careful thinking and taking the right decision. You're like, when I talked about, for example, the content, the production pipeline, it's that is, for example, when I arrive sometimes like a little bit too late on a project and building a piece of content that is supposed to be core to the experience is like super expensive. I'm like, uh, it's going to be a tough. So maybe we don't, we don't go live because <laughs> it's, we're not going to be able to, uh, to maintain basically you know, like the, the challenge of building content on a regular basis. Okay, pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> then there's a there's ways as well. Like it's I I did a shortcut because of course I couldn't present for two hours. But when we talk about the business model, you don't necessarily need to either have you know, like the full live ops with the season pass and the rotation system in the store you can say hey, look i'm not going to have enough content but i still prefer to have a store so i'm just going to have a regular store that's it you know just going to have a regular store no battle pass so there are many ways to accommodate uh, and try to find the right model uh, so yeah yeah um i have another question um do you think th oh we have another. We have a reply from uh, yes, from Peter. <laughs> so even the best planning might go south south sometimes. Yes. Do you have some kind of buffer in your planning? I am interested if even the best companies accept the possibility that not everything can be estimated or planned. Yeah. You, 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 need, you need to be able to accept the possibility that you're going to screw up, that's for sure. <laughs> but that's the reason we, we plan uh, so much ahead. So for example, just to give you like what I, when I say you know, like that I ask my dev team to work four year, like with a four year plan, uh, what I have them do basically is really work on two years of content. So it doesn't mean that the content is ready two years in advance, but it means that at least we know exactly what we're producing one year before into the, the the coming year you know so i try to to have at least that buffer uh because you never know when you're like you're gonna have a shitstorm happening because a feature suddenly is not working for our players and is causing retention issue for example and you're like okay well we're pushing everything back so it is you need to have buffer that's for sure uh so yeah usually like the, the best buffer is at least uh, nine months to a year, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> but in terms of planning, because you know, like the main issue that you have, especially if you have a game on console, like certification is going to take you maybe like two or three months. So <laughs> that was what I was telling before, you know, like it's, uh, so yeah. Does, does that answer your, your question, Peter? Maybe. <laughs> we know <laughs> it in, in a few seconds, I think. <laughs> So, um, about, uh, I, oh, yep, all good. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Nice. Um, and I have a question. Do you think that uh, the advances in artificial intelligence over the last few years uh, will, cha will change something in the life ops strategy? Oh, 
That's a very good question. Love this question. <laughs> uh, so content-wise, it could uh, because you know, like maybe tomorrow, like you can use AI to say, hey, do like twenty variation in terms of you know, like three D asset for this base asset that I designed, and then you know, like iteration system can you know, like for example be a thing. I'm still wary of one thing. It's something that's being discussed a little bit with some companies that, you know, if you're producing art using AI uh, with an open source system where they collect, you know, like many information, there's still that challenge of like how many, you know, um, owners or, you know, like sub owners of that art is really there. You know, it's, yeah. there's still that big question that is not answered that, make some people not 100% sure that in the future you can just say to an AI, hey, build me like 20 skins for that character. You know, there's what if that AI takes some elements from another game? We, we know that, of course, as you know, like many artists are influenced by each other, but it's a different case when it's an AI that picks randomly and you don't exactly know what they're taking. So that question still needs to be answered before we see maybe like uh you know like skins or at least uh live ops content being generated by ai uh, so yeah so that that's uh, that's the one thing then the, the second thing like when i talk about ai for the store and stuff like this i think that more and more people will use this uh, because it's super complex you know like to do those uh, segmentation stuff like this you need tons of data um, and AI is basically are, are really good at, at making that job. Uh, so yeah, what, what else uh, do I think with AI? Uh, yeah, and then there are obvious stuff that are more like with game design, you know, like with the fact that you know, like stronger AI is maybe in the future, you like instead of you know, like having to write quests, maybe quests will be generated themselves automatically. So mm -hmm. like the idea of having a live game, if you have an RPG, if you have AIs that you know, like automatically can generate, uh, you know, like uh, one-time quests, then that would bring about a, a super interesting change in terms of gameplay. But then you're like, it's uh, will the writing be good enough? Like uh, I think I've I've seen some articles that say that AIs are not really that great yet. Uh, you know, like building like um, a story, for example, that makes sense, stuff like this. So, but yeah. So there are, there are things that could happen in the future. Okay, so you are already thinking about the idea of uh, using maybe artificial intelligence uh, in your game. Yeah. That's it? No? Uh, are you not already yet. Not testing yet, but some things? But not, not yet. We're, we're looking, not yet, but we're looking into it. Okay, no. Yeah. It's a possibility. Um, if anybody has other questions, Maybe, no, not, okay. So this is the end of the, this masterclass. It was really interesting. I, I really enjoy, enjoy myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope it's the same thing for everybody. Thank you a lot, Christophe, for your time and, uh, and your presentation. Pleasure. Thank you Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.